Welcome to Inside Vox, uh, our uh, occasional interview program. And today I'm delighted to be uh, joined by William Binney, former NSA analyst uh, and uh, subsequent whistleblower. Welcome to the program, Bill. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, could we start, uh, be very interested just to hear why you chose to resign or actually retire from the NSA in, in 2001 and, and really what made you decide to become a whistleblower? Well, I mean, the point, uh, what, what, what happened was they were taking uh, programs that we had developed in, internally in the NSA in the SIGINT Automation Research Center uh, to be able to monitor uh, the entire world. But they first started to focus them on the citizens inside the United States, and that started in early October 2001. So that, that meant uh, they were violating the fundamental principles of the foundation of our country, the Constitution. And so I had to get I had to get out of there. I couldn't be part of it. And I knew that that orders came from the White House because uh, they wouldn't do anything like that because uh, they would all be subject to uh, going to jail. And also the president would be subject to impeachment which uh, they kept secret so that it didn't happen. And, and they're conditioning our population over time now to try to get us used to this mass surveillance of us. So, but the reason it's fundamental, they were violating the constitution and uh, I couldn't be a part of it. Um, this took place in 2001, is that correct? That's correct, October 2001. Well, because this is quite interesting. The first, the first time I sort of, became aware of this this mass surveillance program, I suppose it would have been, I think it was 2002 or 2003, Poindexter's uh, Information Awareness Office. And it's interesting that you say that they were intending to, to uh, surveil the entire world because of course the logo for that was uh, an eye looking, across, looking over the entire world. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of those uh, programs that were being developed under uh, the Information Awareness Office eventually became programs that were exposed by Edward, Edward Snowden? Uh, no, those weren't the programs. The programs that Edward Snowden exposed were the ones that we designed. The They're ones the ones that... actually doing it. And, and in fact, the uh, Poindexter's uh, TIA program, Total Information Awareness Program, was pushed out there. I figured they did that simply to push Poindexter out to see how the reaction would be in Congress. Uh, in other words, they were set, but what they were already doing in NSA, they were pushing Poindexter out there to try to make him the front guy to be... Uh, to say it publicly, uh, but that when he got all the fire back from Congress and the public, they terminated the PIA program there, but it, the whole program was still running at NSA and continued even to date. Uh, right, so so that answers one of my questions because I was interested, at, at, at the time, I wasn't really quite able to work out uh, why they'd, they'd made this quite such a public thing. Um, yeah. uh, and so so you're, you're suggesting or arguing that that was, purely to see what kind of response they were going to get from the public and from Congress? If they didn't get, a, if they didn't get strong resistance, they would do it out in the public then. See, that, could authorize, that, could, that could give them some uh, authorization or justification for continuing um, publicly. But uh, when, it didn't, when it didn't happen, they had to keep it all in secret and keep very few people informed of it. And that's fundamentally what they did. Um, well, subsequent to that, a couple of years later, uh, the BBC produced uh, a, a series, a, a, sh a short series called uh, The Last Enemy, which really as its core uh, idea was this idea of total information awareness. Uh, clearly it was, a, it was a, 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 a fictional thing, but they were trying to do perhaps a little bit of predictive programming maybe. Uh, but yes. uh, I was wondering whether, whether in the United States you had similar uh, media input uh, to try and encourage people to accept this type of surveillance? Not until much later. <clears throat> I mean, we had the uh, Ashcroft visit at the hospital in 2004, which was all about this program too, by the way. Uh, and then what they did when that occurred, what happened was they, they informed a few more people in Congress because they had to, they had to tell Congress what this uh, ruckus was in the Department of Justice, you know, so because there were a number of people ready to resign, inclu including Ashcroft. And so they had to they had to inform Congress, certain members of Congress, the Gang of Eight, and they had uh, <clears throat> and, and uh, that was their way of uh, getting around the, the hospital visit and the and the legal aspects of it. They modified that a little bit, but didn't change the fundamentals at all. So that's how they kept that going. And then and after the New York Times article, they had to inform the rest of the members of the Senate and, and House Intelligence, 
And we had a, a member of the FISA court resign over it because here, here he was, this judge, Robinson, I think his name was, he, he was there going along fat, dumb, and happy, thinking he was being told by the, the truth by the uh, government for, to get warrants. When in fact, here was the whole program spying on everybody in the United States and everybody in the world going on behind his back, and he didn't know it. And he was the one of the judges you know, that was required at the FISA court to, to uh, sign these uh, warrants that the intelligence community was asking for. So he resigned. And that happened in 2006, January. So you also retired and uh, became a whistleblower. Um, yeah. what, 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 what was the difference between the way you were seeing things going in terms of this pervasive uh, surveillance and the work that the NSA had done up to that point? Well, uh, up to that point, we were, I, I looked at it, I characterized it this way. <clears throat> Uh, prior to the October 2001, we were looking at groups of people, that is, uh, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, those kinds of things, or <clears throat> militaries or governments, you know, things that are, we needed to know about, make, uh, planning decisions in the U.S. government. So it was looking at groups of people planning to do things, trying to figure out what their planning was so we could issue statements of warning and intentions and capability, you know. Uh, but after uh, October, in October, they started looking individual. So that meant it shifted from doing looking at a focused group of people who are doing bad things or intending to do bad things, and then just looking at individuals, every individual in the world. So that was a total violation of privacy rights of individuals right from the beginning. That was clear to me right in October 2001. And, and ultimately, that hasn't uh, resulted in just in simply surveillance on. Uh, the average yep. man in the street, but that surveillance apparently has gone right to the White House, or well, at least to to, to a presidential candidate. Oh yeah, and yeah, it, it's uh, it's gone against everybody. I mean, there's no exceptions. So if they wanted to do things, I mean, and, and GCHQ over there has direct access to this data too. So NSA has become the storage facility for the Five Eyes and about eight or nine other countries in the world who are participating in this bulk acquisition of data. And uh, they use the IC Reach program, uh, the Five Eyes use the IC Reach program to look into this data, do the queries that they have. And the rest of the, the countries and the embassies and so on around the world use X Key Score to look into it. So those are the two main programs to interrogate the massive databases that they've created, like they're using the million square foot facility at Utah. There's another 600,000 square foot facility in San Antonio. And so there's storage in Denver and Hawaii and, and at Fort Meade, of course. And then on Fort Meade, they started building a new facility there, a 2.8 million square foot facility. They took out a 36 hole golf course to do it. It's called the Eisenhower Golf Course. So I'm sure Eisenhower's rolling over in his grave because he lost his golf course, you know. Obviously, they're, they're doing this uh, bulk acquisition of data. Um, yeah. but, uh, and we know they're doing it, but what isn't really known is what capability they have to process uh, this amount of data. Well, they don't have the capability to process it because, I mean, look at the numbers of terrorist attacks around the world that have occurred, all by people who have been known. And if they'd have been following the people who have known, they would have had a chance to prevent them. And in this case, what they've done is taking bulk acquisition and thrown it in and put it in big piles and having their analysts interrogated with their current interrogation programs. And those are failing miserably. I mean, <clears throat> the, the, the problem is, that even internally in NSA, from the Snowden material, there were documents of many articles, 10 of them written in NSA, some in MI5 and some in uh, uh, GCHQ, I think, that gave uh, it's like, we're overburdened by overload and can't see the threat coming, you know, and things like that. And so what's happening is uh, these intelligence agencies that are supposed to predict intentions and capabilities, that is, threats, mm -hmm. so that they can adopt Right, <clears throat> they're losing that capability because of the massive amounts of data that are being dumped on their people who have to do, perform that job. If we could just come back to to the the surveillance <laughs> on on Donald Trump for a second, because you mentioned yeah. GCHQ there. Um, there was a there was an allegation at one point that that um, actually GCHQ was involved in in the surveillance on Donald Trump because clearly there would be a potentially an issue if the NSA was, was doing this directly. Uh, have you any knowledge of whether that was the case? Uh, I don't have absolute knowledge, but there is some information that's available that suggests that was true. Now, whether that's that's right or not or verifiable, I, I don't have the resources to, to verify it, but, you know, 
That has to be looked into by Attorney General Barr. Is that something that uh, you expect that he will do? Yes. Obviously, this is uh, is going on in the United States. This same kind of uh, bulk acquisition of data is going on in the United Kingdom. Uh, in the UK, uh, we had uh, legislation brought in in the year 2000. That was the Regulation of Investigatory, Power, Investigatory Powers Act. Uh, but despite that, uh, as, as time went on from, the, from 2000 uh, up to date, certainly in 2014, uh, there were lawyers in the UK uh, very concerned that uh, what GCHQ was doing was in breach of REPA. Um, so the government then effectively brought a piece of legislation in in 2016, the Investigatory Powers Act, which yep. attempted to <laughs> retrospectively legalize the law breaking that had been happening up to that point. Yep. So um, I was interested to know whether whether there had been some kind of similar effort in the United States. <clears throat> I, in fact, uh, testified to the committee, uh, the House of Lords Committee investigating or uh, discussing that investigative powers bill uh, when, when it came up back in uh, 2016, I think it was, as you yes, mentioned. Yes, that's yeah. right, yeah. So, uh, in the U.S., uh, they, have, of course, in 2008, had to give uh, retroactive immunity uh, to the telecommunications company for assisting the U.S. government in doing their, their uh, uh, actually, uh, collection of data on everybody. Uh, and yet, when they did that, they never told the Congress what they were voting for, why they were giving them retroactive immunity. And it was because they were putting fiber optic taps on the lines and support, supported by the telecommunications company running the lines. Also, they would support them in acquisition of data. You know, they would put like, you could think of it as putting prisms in the fiber optic lines, and the prism would split the line in two ways, and then send one, one route to the SA rooms inside their own buildings of the communications uh, telecoms companies. And, uh, and they, NSA would capture all that data that way. And then the telecommunications company were also, also feeding them all the records that they had ac accumulated on their customers, like the billing records and things like that. So um, that's what they gave retroactive immunity for, but they never told the Congress that that's what it was for. So that was the that was the way they got around it in 2008, and and then uh, it, for that for that later on they used the Patriot Act, Section 215, mm -hmm. which they had their own interpretation to make that happen. And then for the justification of the bulk acquisition of data, they're using Executive Order 12333, Section 23C, that allows them to say says in there, if you, uh, you're you after a terrorist or a dope smuggler or some international criminal, and you're looking at a communications line and you think he's on that line, you could take the whole line in, everything, store it, interrogate it, find the, find the bad guy, and you can keep it. And that's what they're doing. That's the way they're interpreting that. Right. And so that's how they justify it, but it's all done in secret. Now, we're challenging that. I've got F.I. Davidson in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals and also in the Ninth uh, the courts just under the uh, Supreme Court, uh, uh, basically accusing the government of uh, a bulk collection on U.S. citizens in violation of the First, Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments to the Constitution, uh, as well as all kinds of other laws like the Pen Register Law, the Electronic Privacy Act, Electronic Security Act, all the all the laws, FCC regulations, communications companies too. So, so uh, and the government is slow rolling that to try and get into it. And now I've got another in, uh, and this one has to do with Roger Stone. I've got an affidavit in his case I'm submitted to, uh, talking about uh, some of this stuff and how the the fault the basically lie about the Russian hack of the DNC, and we can prove that forensically. And that's why I put it in that that FISA, uh, I mean the uh, the uh, affidavit into that court. But that's a criminal court, you know. And this is not civil. Other cases are in civil courts. So this one is criminal. So if you want to proceed with the criminal court, we have a chance of putting it in the, in the record there. Now, uh, a word which uh, <laughs> has been appearing increasingly uh, in uh, British politics and some of the policy documents and so on is the word fusion. Um, and uh, so I was interested in asking first, uh, <laughs> what is a fusion center? Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, that's their attempt to co correlate data you know, from different sources and different inputs. And so they're trying to bring it all together and make one picture. That's the, that's what uh, fundamentally we were doing back in uh, the 1990s, uh, doing that kind of thing, a fusion type thing, but we were doing it with software. Most of this effort's being done by people and, and people manipulating data with tools, you know. Uh, 
Our, our point was you need to automate this and get people out of the way because they they can only see and comprehend so much at a time, whereas with the software, you can do the whole, the whole thing. Over here, we're starting to hear of, of fusion centers being set up uh, in the UK. <clears throat> but uh, the other interesting development, uh, I think it was in the uh, uh, National Security Review that was published in March 2018, uh, the, the British government is now uh, pursuing what they describe as a fusion doctrine. Uh, and the basis of this is that basically uh, there will be an, well, they describe it as an all of government approach. Uh, and that means that there's data sharing between government departments, uh, that there's uh, intelligence services and GCHQ involvement in that. Uh, and yep. and uh, uh, so this has become a, a core tenet of the so-called national security uh, capability. Um, and is that something that you're seeing in the United States as well? Yeah, that's uh, that's been going on for quite some time, and it involves the FBI, DEA, uh, IRS, <laughs> DHS, uh, a bunch of U.S. agencies are all together, and they're all <clears throat> they're all, of course, focusing on inputs from the from the National Security Agency uh, databases, which again are the common databases for the Five Eyes and the other nine countries that are participating, eight or nine, I think of it is. So. Uh, that, that then is the, the foundation of information that they're using as background, and it's stored for a long period of time. I, I, I figure it's at least five years at Utah, and they're probably with the new facility, they're going to have another five years. So I think that distributed around all their storage facilities, they probably have close to 10 years of data stored right now, T 10 or more, basically, maybe even back to, certainly with the metadata, there's no problem with storing that back in 2001, and, and there's no all right, problem if you want to keep it for a couple hundred years, you know, so that's not a problem. The content is the problem. That's why you keep building all these big storage facilities, you know. And so it's a, according to can store as much as they have a, a storage facilities to manage. But uh, it back at least a decade. So so all the stuff can be retroactively analyzed. Uh, OK, and I should I should probably mention that uh, the fusion doctrine in Britain also includes uh, connectivity with uh, with private companies and and NGOs yep. and and third sector organizations as well. So so it is absolutely all encompassing. Let's talk about RussiaGate for a minute because right. obviously uh, <clears throat> there is a, an intelligence services uh, and and GCHQ connection with what's gone on with RussiaGate in the sense uh, that Christopher Steele, Richard Dearlove, and and people around that uh, little grouping of so-called ex-intelligence uh, services have been deeply involved in Russiagate? Uh, well, my, my point was, I think, uh, uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, President Trump is being spied on now. He was being spied on when he was a candidate. He was being spied on even before that, uh, probably for quite a number of years, as he is a rather influential person and somebody to watch. So, uh, you know, they, they do that kind of thing, not just with the... Uh, uh, they do that for all the members of Congress, the House and Senate, also for judges, federal judges, all of them, and, and the Supreme Court. And, and they watch the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as well as everybody in the White House. All this being done in secret in NSA. Um, and, of course, CIA started their own par parallel program, too. So, uh, But these kinds of things are what these agencies tend to do, is to look at and monitor people who have any authority over them anyway, you know. So if they have authority over them, they're going to be monitored so they can see what they're planning for them, you know, what they're planning in terms of budgetary or motions to, or things to, to manage how they operate, you know, and what kinds of things they're planning for them to do, like covert programs or, or collection programs, things like that. For the Russia Gate, though, thing, I mean, the whole thing was a fabrication from the beginning. Yes. When they, when they said the uh, DNC emails were hacked by the Russians, uh, well, our group, the VIPs, Veteran Intelligence and Professionals for Sanity, plus some of some folks over your way, we were all getting together and working on this, trying to figure out what really was the truth. And when you looked at the DNC data, the actual files from May that were published by WikiLeaks, this is put on the web by WikiLeaks. Those those files had a, had fat format properties in them, all of them. So that meant this is where this is where the last modified time that's modified by the data by the program reading them to to a storage device like a thumb drive or a CD-ROM, so uh, that that rounds off the last modified time to the nearest even number, second. So all of those had a, had pretty evident. So that meant 
that that data was read first to a thumb drive or a, a CD-ROM or something and physically transported before WikiLeaks could publish it. Now that fits right in with what Julian Assange said, what Craig Murray, Ambassador Craig Murray from uh, from the UK said. That that uh, has a major implication then for what's going on with Julian Assange <laughs> at the moment. Absolutely, it destroys everything the government is saying here. What what do they think that they are going to achieve with the uh, latest indictments and the effort to to extradite him? Uh, is <clears throat> If he, if he has his day in court, do they actually have much of a chance of, of succeeding in, in, in achieving a guilty verdict? Uh, here's how I think they'll run that. I, I originally thought that this is what they were going to do. That is, they were using uh, the allegation that he assisted uh, uh, Chelsea Manning in, in breaking in through a, uh, uh, breaking, breaking in past through the password the protection devices inside inside the area where he was. And I, you know, initially thought, how, how are you going to do that remotely? You know, <laughs> my question is, I, I, can you say, get on the phone and say, OK, Chelsea, try this. Yeah, that didn't work. OK, try this. You know, you know what I mean? It's kind of hard for me to envision how to do that. Remotely. Uh, but that was the allegation. I think it was just to get him extradited from the UK so they could get him to the U.S. And then they would put the real charges in. That's what that's what's been going on. And now they're starting to do that, you know, the under the Espionage Act. Uh, it's hard for me to understand how how somebody uh, from another country can be charged with espionage against the, the United States. I mean, that would say that anybody in the world who does anything, that publishes anything that government, U.S. government is doing is subject to U.S. law and they're in a, and basically treated as a U.S. citizen. I mean, I don't know how they can do that either, but that's what they're doing. Did I see they had to go at you at one point uh, under the Espionage yeah, Act? Did. Yep. Uh, yeah, they, yeah, they uh, they tried to, to to indict for conspiracy, basically, you know, uh, and of course uh, the difference is, I caught them at it, and I assembled all this evidence of malicious prosecution, and I threatened them with it. I said, okay, let's go to court, and be aware we're going to charge you with this malicious prosecution. So at that point, they dropped everything and ran away from us. Getting back to Assange for a second, what what what? Yeah. What is the outcome likely to be if, if he is uh, brought to the uh, United States? Uh, here's, I think, what they did uh, to uh, Chelsea Manning and also uh, uh, John Kiriakou. They brought the, uh, <clears throat> the evidence into court, but because it was classified, the, the uh, uh, prosecution lawyers went behind closed doors with the judge, showed them the evidence, and they convicted him in closed session. Mm -hmm. Then they came out and told the defense and the defendant, what the result was. Uh, and I figured that was, it. and I forget the name of how they call that. Uh, there's a there's a, a legal term for it in use uh, when you're trying to, when you're trying to protect supposed classified material, you know? Uh, and I, well, I have an issue with that because uh, under executive order 13526, section 1.7, that's the that's the order that that uh, that governs all classification in the United States, and that was their justification for closing the doors. And what they did was they went behind closed doors to to address things like the, you know, the uh, collateral murder movie and things like that that were being done. Um, and that data under that executive order must be declassified because it's evidence of a crime. And what that that order says fundamentally, it's on the web. Anybody can go read it. Executive Order 13526, look at Section 1.7, and you'll see that it says you cannot classify, maintain classified, or not declassify any evidence of a crime uh, or corruption, fraud, waste, abuse, or criminality of any kind. And that's that's in that executive order. So a lot of that data, including some of the data from Putin, must be declassified according to that, because it's evidence of a crime. <laughs> that that, uh, that I can see how there there could be a some people would argue at least that there could be a, a conflict there if if yeah, there some is. of the, <laughs> sorry I say there there certainly is that's for sure yes yes <laughs> okay okay I'm interested in, in in your thoughts on on this whole idea of giving up privacy for security because this is this is this is the justification for everything that's going on at the moment I call I call that the uh, the first swindle of everybody. Uh, what they did was they said, <clears throat> like you you put it here, you have to, <clears throat> in order to have security, you have to give up privacy. <clears throat> well, 
I mean, that, that was false from the beginning, and we knew that. And the Thin Thread program we developed internally in NSA proved that, except that it didn't cost any anywhere near that the money that the bulk acquisition did. Could you expand <laughs> a little bit on the on the the encryption thing? Because if yeah. if you were gathering data on individuals, you were then holding that in an encrypted form. Is that right? And and if so, uh, then what were what were the circumstances on, on, yeah. the, under which the, that would be decrypted? Then yeah, we uh, basically we didn't. Uh, we, what we did was we encrypt the identifiers, right? The, the IP numbers, the phone numbers, and name any names or things like that, and we in, encrypted that so that nobody could tell who it was, what, what, <clears throat> who was sending an email, but they could see what was in the email, <clears throat> or or uh, <clears throat> or what they were saying on the phone. You could do a translation of it, but you couldn't see their identity, <clears throat> so that no one in even in NSA could know who it was. Now the 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 uh, point then was that. Uh, we could use that data to justify, prove whether or not they were involved in an activity or not, like terrorism or dope smuggling or something like that. And if we could prove it, then we would issue a request for warrant and then unmask them, basically, and then use their identity and in the open and target them out in the open because we'd have a warrant. Uh, that was done basically on all the people who were within the zone of suspicion around a known bad. By our definition of two degrees, uh, no more than two degrees in the network or the uh, tele email network or the uh, or the uh, financial network. Okay, so that was the that was the way that we protected their identities. Even after we took the data in, we would do that. But until we got a warrant, then we wouldn't unmask their identity. So, so that the, was the, the the warrant was the key thing here. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, we had probable cause and justification for doing it. Uh, and this, of course, is no longer the case. No. Nope. Something else that I was interested to see you commenting on recently was uh, was Stuxnet and the use of of uh, cyber attacks. Uh, and this is something, of course, which is uh, being driven home to us that, that cybersecurity is probably one of the most important things uh, uh, well, that, that, that the government is doing. Uh, and and uh, that's part of the justification for, for mass data collection as well. Uh, but uh, one of the discussions I saw you having, you were talking about Stuxnet as an example, and you were making the point that once one of these things uh, goes out live, it, it's effectively uncontrollable after that point. And in fact, what you end up having, having is that perhaps some of the people that you that you want to be, uh, that, that you have it, an interest in, uh, have the capability to reverse engineer that and do something with it themselves? Uh, well, uh, I think the uh, the uh, wannabe virus that spread around the world a few uh, a year ago or something like that yeah. was one of the examples of how they would modify, slightly modify one of the attacks that came from either Vault 7 or the NSA leaks. Uh, but I call, the, I call this cybersecurity thing the second swindle. The first swindle was the of the, of the public for money. The first swindle was uh, you have to give up privacy for security. This swindle is you have to when 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 these agencies know they've got hundreds of millions of lines of source code for attacks, attacks on firewalls, operating systems, uh, switches and servers, networks, all the the entire network. They have the all these tens of thousands of source source code lines that constitute thousands of attacks. I mean, who who knows how many attacks there are. Uh, and once those were leaked, they were out there in the world. <clears throat> and the point was <clears throat> that these agencies knew these weaknesses in the system existed for over, you know, about two, two and a half decades. So that when you do that, they left the, they left the weaknesses in so that they could see in and read what people were saying and doing. Uh, but they didn't fix them. Well, when you don't fix them, that means everybody's vulnerable to those kinds of weaknesses. And when other people, other countries, like China or, or Russia or Israel or or anybody, when they find those weaknesses, they can penetrate them too. So that leaves that means that we're all vulnerable. But then when we get attacked, what do they say about? Well, we need more money for cybersecurity. Well, maybe this is a good time to introduce the issue of Huawei then, because uh, we are told in the UK that uh, uh, it's absolutely critical that Huawei is not involved in the. Uh, the, the development of and the build out yeah. of, of our 5G networks. And, and the, the <laughs> argument seems to be that uh, the intelligence services, GCHQ and so on, are going to be using the five the public 5G networks to, to for their own uh, communications as well as yep. 
as well as tapping them effectively. So, uh, I mean, I understand that the, the, the furore around Huawei is quite a bit uh, more significant in the United States. It's still quite understated in this country. It's, it's some, some comments about really we shouldn't be doing that. But what are your thoughts on, on, on Huawei's involvement in, in, uh, in the build out of future tele telecoms? Uh, well, first of all, any any uh, any um, uh, major purchase of equipment like that, installing the communications network of any country, they have to be realizing what, once they do that, they have the option, they have the potential of bringing in uh, tapping points for for the country where they're buying the the uh, product from. Uh, for example, that's how uh, we, in fact, Im implanted tens of thousands of implants around the world. One of the ways was to was to implant hardware and software in devices that were being uh, uh, the countries. And so once they installed that, they installed our tapping device. So, you know, we had tens of thousands of them across the network. Uh, and that's the that's the way with the 5G, when the internet's to the internet of things, you know, that opens up the more and more aspects of life of everybody around the world. So, that's all for, for the ability to tap. Now, if they have in, a software or hardware in there to be able to do that, that's what they'd have to scan every device buying to make sure that wasn't true. Uh, then, then once we'd install them, we'd be installing tapping points for the for the China, and then China could begin pulling in all that data from the world. Uh, but again, uh, DCAQ and NSA would be able to monitor and see that that's happening just by the bulk acquisition of data and transfer. Even if they couldn't read it, they could still say they could still basically understand what they're doing. But uh, if we go back, uh, you know, a few <clears throat> decades over the last few decades, the, the ubiquitous firewall product that every corporation and probably more is using is is Checkpoint, and which of course is a, an Israeli uh, uh, product. So, is it do the same considerations apply there, or is that okay because they're viewed as being a, a, an ally? Uh, no, I would say I would say you have to check everything. I mean, if you're going to buy something from another country, you have to make sure that it's clean. Mm. That that was a standard process even at NSA. If you brought something inside NSA, even if it was a U.S. product, you still had to scan it, make sure it was clean. No, no implants, no software implants, no hardware implants, things like that. So back in the day, then when when uh, the NSA was publishing uh, security guides for for Windows operating systems and so on, were those were those viewed as as being uh, reliable and trustworthy, and 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 uh, if you followed the the uh, the instructions, you were in a reasonably secure position. Yeah, uh, that was uh, of course what they said. Now, whether or not that was true, that's a different subject. Okay, so I mean, with all these back doors and so on, and all these systems, plus some of the weaknesses in their software. I mean, you know, I I just don't think anything on the web is secure. We're about to run out of time, but but before we do that, before we sort of finish, I'd like to to get your thoughts on on uh, the, the 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 use of of surveillance to to help censor uh, opinion on the web and on on social media and so on, uh, because clearly uh, we were talking about the fusion doctrine earlier, but clearly. W the social media companies seem to be reasonably on board with this yep. notion from governments that 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 they need to protect. Uh, in inverted commas, protect uh, people from fake news and so-called disinformation. Yes, uh, we had yeah we had that problem here in the states. They're they're uh, basically we're calling it, they're calling it shadow blocking over here, where the companies will block conservative ideas instead of liberal or progressive. They're advocates for them. That's what these companies are doing, uh, and now they're uh, they're they're uh, basically shutting down certain. Uh, certain uh, cable programs and things of that nature and attacking them. So it's kind of, they're trying to control the narrative inside the country. So that's a way, and they're working with governments to do this, of course. And uh, the point is that, that those are those are the things that they're, uh, that it's a part of the process of uh, controlling the population. I mean, you, you, you have to control the narrative and you have to keep, keep the information that the public sees uh, and is aware of. You have to control that so you can, <clears throat> so you can, Directly or indirectly control what the public does. So, I mean, over here, take, for example, just take the Russia Gate as an example over here. The U.S. media, the mainstream media in the U.S. was pushing that every day into the into the news and pushing it at the people in the country. That's why they they have uh, brought uh, close to half of the population of the United States. To, they got that many people to believe that it was true. 
you know, by by doing that conditioning day after day and and saying it over and over again from all these different news media. That's the way they're conditioning people. And that's basically the fundamentally what these organizations are doing when they're controlling the narrative. They're destroying free speech. They're destroying free thought. I mean, they're saying here is the way to think. And that's fundamentally what they're being that what what the shadow government, uh, sh you know, in the United States and around the world. And I, I see Theresa May was part of that, you know, so and so were other leaders in other countries that are at, have basically bought into this bulk acquisition of data because that's the kind of thing that it allows you to do. You can discover who's not, who's not conforming to your your agenda, and you can then target them and also shadow block them and things of that nature. So, the way of controlling the population, your own country's population. So, what can people do about this? Well, in the United States, uh, I say uh, sue the bastards. Right, first of all, take them into court, uh, get them out in the open. Uh, unfund them any way you can. Uh, call your representatives in the Congress and make sure you bitch and moan and say, if you don't stop this stuff, I'm going to vote against you in the next election, and I'm going to support your opponent, or I'm going to find, or or you can start a Brexit party as you did, as in your country, right? That's the way. That's the way to start it. And you, if you won't get the, if you won't do what you want them to do, for people vote to do something. Either you do it or you're out, and then get rid of them. That's the whole thing to do. You either vote them out. Or put and put people in who will actually do what you want done, or or, or you uh, or you unfund them, or in some way cut them off of them. Uh, yeah. Just to just to finish off, then, uh, if you were to, to choose a couple of, of key targets, I, I assume Julian Assange uh, is is one that that needs support. Yep. Uh, but yes. what uh, is there is there anything else in particular that you think people should be uh, paying attention to? Uh, well, I think. Uh, I think that GDPR in, in the EU is something that's going to be important, especially for, especially for companies who want to do business in the EU. They're going to have to pay attention to that. And that's really getting back to protection of individuals' data and the, and the data about them. That data belongs to the individual. Basically, that's a fundamental principle there. And so if anybody wants to do anything with that data, they have to get the approval of that person. That's the kind of thing that needs to be pushed through. And I, I've been advocating over there that the, the way to do it is to, to sue the companies that are participating in these programs and transferring this data, you know, without the approval of the individuals. So, I mean, I think the, the fine there for every occurrence of that is like uh, up to 21 million euros. <laughs> so <laughs> I would say if one, some of those companies are transferring you know, bulk data, like on millions of people, they're going to be broke rather quickly once they get fined. Yes. Okay. Well, look, uh, Bill, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'd like to do this again at some point, but uh, sure. because I'm sure we've got a lot more we could talk about, but we're, we're out of time for now. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me.